welcome back to Inside the Game with CNHI Sports, where each week we take you around the country with experts from the CNHI Sports staff. We will check in right off the bat with the NFL and our weekly visit with Bill Burt from CNHI Sports Boston. Now we check in for our weekly spot with Bill Burt. And Bill, it's been a busy couple of weeks up there in New England. Uh, what's the situation with the Patriots and how have they handled this uh, seemingly ongoing situation with, with games being moved and postponed and schedules being disrupted all over the place? It has been a strange couple weeks here. Uh, in fact, I wrote about it. Uh, this is even before uh, they actually played a game without Cam Newton. So it's, uh, it's been very trying. Um, you know, and I, I wrote a column last week basically implying, or this last past few days, that the Patriot way is under attack by the virus. And by that, I mean, uh, you know, no games off, no days off. Uh, um, everything that they're about is literally being checked here hardly by the virus, hard by the virus. So that's where we're at right now. Uh, the Patriots are in a state of, I would say, uh, no man's land. Belichick is getting frustrated. He doesn't show it. He hasn't showed it much. He start, He showed it the last couple of days. Um, he's uh, basically the, the indecision of the NFL, I think. Uh, I think going back, we're, we're sort of hearing that the Patriots players weren't happy about going to Kansas City. And they've, they haven't come out and said it was a travesty, but they've sort of implied it. Uh, Devin McCourty uh, did a couple of days ago. Uh, and there was talk that, that maybe there was a revolt behind the scenes where players were pushing Belichick. And I think he was supportive of them saying, you can't leave us in limbo. Either, either there's a game or there's not a game. Let us know. And as we know, Belichick, it, among his great qualities, preparation is number one, probably right at the top of the list. And that's been hard to do. That being said, uh, I've been covering this team for 30 years. I've been covering the 20 years of the, the, the dynasty. And you know what? Uh, no one out there is crying for the Patriots, specifically people in the uh, central Indiana area. Uh, but it's true. I think the Patriots had a couple of people get the virus, a couple of key players. And this is what happens. Um, and they got to deal with it. And it hasn't been easy. Yeah, well, I mean, you look at these last couple of weeks in terms of what it's done to the schedule. As you mentioned, they had to fly out on a Monday, play the Chiefs that night. That's pretty unprecedented in the league. Obviously, things are going to happen. Uh, that people aren't expecting because of this virus, but that was tough to deal with. And then you end up spending an entire week preparing for a Denver game and find out it's not going to be played. That was now your bye week. It's a lot to take in. Tennessee's had a similar situation going on. Uh, it took them a couple weeks to get their situation under control. Do you think the league as a whole is getting to a point where they're running out of wiggle room? I mean, there's only so many bye weeks that you can play with, so many games you can move around. Are they learning the lessons fast enough that they need to learn from these cases? And can they get things back on track? That is the problem. So there is no more wiggle room. Uh, the next option would be week 18, would be another week of the NFL season. And I would have said that's not happening, but we've literally pushed to the edge. And I think it's probably going to happen with the next team that gets it. And again, they're working their best, their magic. Look. The bye week is important for writers, too. We usually take that week off. I'm supposed to be off next week, but now I'm working. And that's what happens. Same with most writers around Lee. It's the one week we get we get at least a little bit of a break. And uh, so that's not happening. And we're all sort of in the same boat. It It, it is, um, you know, it's different. It's not great. But I'm not going to complain. I, I really think, um, you know, the players really haven't complained much except the late decision-making. Uh, you know, the safety thing, I think that's come up. Are players safe? Do they feel 100% safe? They're not coming off saying it, per se. I, I guess probably between themselves, they're a little concerned. But I look, right now, as we speak, there is zero wiggle room. And uh, it, it's the way it's looking, a, a three or four other teams are going to get it over the next month. And they're probably going to have to extend the season one week. Is that the end of this? Is that going to ruin football? No, but it does cause planning, planning issues in terms of the playoffs in the Super Bowl. So we'll see. Uh, I'm looking forward to just playing, going to a football game on Sunday, and uh, I really am. I have. It's been a couple of weeks. It's it's weird when you plan for football, whether you're a fan or you're a writer. 
And then when I say put your team, you cover the team, and then it doesn't happen. It's just not the same. Yeah, there's no doubt. I'm sure you'll be very happy just to be able to cover football and, and talk about what's going on on the field again for a change. Let's do that right here real quick. Uh, first team I want to bring up is the Las Vegas Raiders, a big upset victory over the Chiefs on Sunday. Uh, opened a lot of eyes with that offense and how effective they were. You saw them a few weeks ago against the Patriots. What's your take on this Las Vegas team, and can it be a contender in this crazy 2020 NFL season? Well, it tells you what I know. I thought they were. They left New England a seven and nine team. That was a horrendous game. Um, he was out coached. Uh, John uh, Gruden was, and uh, quarterback Derek Carr looked like Derek Carr. And not the Patriots played great because they just sort of slowly. It's what the the Patriots did. What they do a lot of times, they methodically take over a game, and then the blowout score. I don't know if it was really. You know, look, they they, were, they scored a touchdown. And then got a sack in the end zone and scored another touchdown. That made it into a quick blowout because it did not look like a blowout in the first half. But I'm, I was not impressed with the Raiders. Uh, look, I, Josh Jacobs, I think, is a star. Um, and, I, you know, other than that, you know, the tight end's very good. They got one good wide receiver. I'm just not a big guy, a car guy. Uh, my issue would be I'm wondering if Kansas City just sort of, you know, was a little lax there, like they might have been for the Patriots. Look, this happens when teams win Super Bowls. They come back the next year, they lose a couple of games they probably shouldn't lose, and they find their way back to being pretty good or good. I Look, Kansas City is still, in my opinion, the team to beat, but the Super Bowl blues happened. And uh, I'm more I, – I saw the Raiders. I was not impressed with them under duress against a, a good Patriots team. You know, they're a great team. So – I'm not ready to, to anoint the Raiders anything. I think they're going to anoint themselves because they did after they went 2-0. and They started walking around like they were a great team, and they weren't. And so I'm, uh, I'm, if I'm guessing, I'm guessing that was more KC took a, took a break. Then there's a team that I got a good look at this Sunday, obviously. The Cleveland Browns won a big game with the Indianapolis Colts. Last year was supposed to be the year for Cleveland. Everybody was hot on them coming into the season. They fell on their face. The coach got fired. Another huge change of regime over there. Now, all of a sudden, their stars are playing like stars. Miles Garrett looks like he's a guy who's going to be in the conversation for Defensive Player of the Year. Jarvis Landry and Odell Beckham Jr. on Sunday look like big-time wide receivers that you pay that money to. Their running game with Kevin Stefanski has looked amazing all year. And now if they can get Baker Mayfield, I think that's a big question here. Can they get him to play within himself the way he did in the first half? Or are they going to get the Baker Mayfield that rushes and, and makes mistakes as he did in the second half? But do you think this Cleveland team is a team that obviously they're in a very tough division. With Pittsburgh and Baltimore and what they're doing, they're going to probably have to go into the playoffs as a wild card. Could they be a team that you talked about earlier this year that could get hot at the right time and make a playoff run? Yeah, so I'm not a big maker, Baker Mayfield guy. I think what he did in college, what made him great, was his unpredictability, his rolling out of the pocket. That doesn't that doesn't move to the NFL. They're just the athlete, they're too athletic. And his Doug Flutie factor, I, I don't, I haven't seen it. That being said, he's played well, and they don't need him to be great to be a good team. So are they going to be in the hunt for a wild card? Absolutely. Are they Baltimore, Pittsburgh ready? Uh, I'm not sure about Pittsburgh. I know Pittsburgh said, you know, they're 5-0 and or 4-0. and They're undefeated per se. But uh, C Cleveland is going to be an interesting team. If they're going to depend on Baker Mayfield, no. it's it, They're an 8-8 eight eight team. But, I, I, you know, they could be pushing 10-6. and six. They could have, a you know, a 12-4, and 11-5, and five, and a 10-6 and six team in that division. It is a very good division. And the way they run the ball – uh, that makes Baker Mayfield a little bit better. He's Look, I'm not going to take anything away from him because I, I think he's had a pretty good year so far, but he's on the perfect team because they don't need him to be great. They're going to be pretty good. I, that that division is going to be one to watch here. Yeah, I think that's probably the division to keep an eye on the rest of the year. One more thing before we go. I want to talk about some of the rookie quarterbacks. Uh, obviously, on Monday night, Justin Herbert put on show from the country four touchdown passes. The Chargers continue to lose games in, in the most – uh, heartbreaking fashion. It's sort of a franchise tradition out there. Good to see that they're continuing that in 2020. At least something stayed the same. But also Joe Burrow in Cincinnati. I think he's had some really big days. Baltimore got to him, uh, really beat him up a little bit. How concerning is it that he's taken 22 sacks already this year? And what do you make of Herbert and his ability to make the Chargers at least competitive so, so quick in his career? What is it? Peyton Manning, what did he say? Look it up, kickers. Well, <laughs> I'm going to say uh, cocky quarterbacks. I, I look, I'm a big fan 
a big fan of Cincinnati, Joe Burrow. Uh, I I swear he is going to be very good. Is he going to be top three or four? Ah, you know what? He might be. I like him. I like his toughness. And this rookie year, learn from mistakes. R remember, um, a Troy Aikman winless the first year, or, or might have won one game. Uh, this this year is strictly about learning. Uh, I, I like his competitive fire. He's a legit quarterback. I like, I, and I think the guy you mentioned before in, with the Chargers, the first pass I saw him throw, I go, whoa. Like you just, something looked, all he did was step back, step up and throw the ball. And I said, whoa, that's, that's not normal. And I, it wasn't anything special. It was, it might've been an incomplete pass, but there's, you can see he looks like a big time quarterback. Now he's not there. But nice little game last night. Uh, he got beat by a, a legendary quarterback. He had a kicker who makes the kick there. He doesn't hit the post. Goes in. All of a sudden, we're talking rookie of the week, player of the week, four touchdown passes. Uh, I am. Uh, I'm high on both of those guys. You know, Tua in Miami. I don't think he's ready. He's in a little different situation. He moves a lot out of the pocket. Probably more. Uh, probably a lot of more athletic plays. But uh, I like those two quarterbacks and. Um, I'm going to tell you, Justin Herbert, uh, first pass he threw, I said, this guy looks legit. And uh, it's exciting. I love great quarterback. When there's eight or nine or 10, 12 teams that have really good quarterbacks, that makes for a better league. We saw that in the late 80s when I think this the league, in my opinion, was at its all-time best. I think we're seeing it again right now. Yeah, no doubt. And it looks like there's maybe some more on the way this year. Yeah. Uh, the league definitely in good hands for the future. Thanks a lot, Bill. We'll give you some time. I know you lost your bye week. Let's let you get get a break here. We'll see you again next week. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thanks again to Bill. You can follow his New England Patriots coverage at Burt Talk Sports. You can follow me and my Indianapolis Colts coverage at GM Bremer. Now let's shift gears a little bit, head to the college game, and check in with Kevin Brockway of CNHI Sports Indiana. All right, let's make our weekly trip to Big Ten country. You'll notice we're missing one guest today. Elton Hayes is on vacation. He'll be back next week. So we welcome in Kevin Brockway of CNHI Sports Indiana. And, Kevin, we're both Indiana guys. It's basketball season. Uh, you get your first media availability this week with, with IU coach Archie Miller. What did he have to say as the Big Ten basketball season gets ready to ramp up? Well, you know, I think he's got a comfort level with this roster being that, you know, this is year four, so this is all his guys, right? You know, every guy that he's recruited on the team. So I think he's looking for a team that uh, can eventually evolve into being a more perimeter-oriented team. He said it's not going to be that way overnight. Uh, he's also counting on big things from Jerome Hunter, uh, you know, who is uh, now more than uh, two years removed from that leg surgery. He's a guy that can kind of fill in that swingman role for Justin Smith. I think he'll get the first crack at it. And then from uh, from there, you know, obviously you have Trace Jackson Davis returning uh, all Big Ten, uh, uh, you know, uh, third team uh, All-American uh, preseason Blue Ribbon. Uh, last year was an all Big Ten freshman and all Big Ten third team uh, freshman as well. So uh, I think there are a lot of high expectations, uh, but it's tough Big Ten, as you know. A lot of players coming back throughout the league. Luke Garza at Iowa, uh, Kofi Coburn and uh, Ayo Desumnu from Illinois. Um, you know, Wisconsin has a lot of their guys back. I mean, I think those three teams coming in are probably the favorites uh, to win the league title. But uh, chance for Indiana to really make a significant move up those Big Ten standings. I know it was disappointing, obviously, across the country uh, when last spring, you know, sporting events started to fall by the wayside. But the Big Ten tournament in particular, everyone was really looking forward to that. It had been such a highly competitive regular season. No one really had any idea who was going to win that tournament and move on into the NCAA tournament. Do you expect that competitive nature of the conference to stay the same? You mentioned a lot of returning guys. Should we expect another league season where uh, it's highly competitive and, and anyone can beat anyone on any given day? You know, I think last year it was like 1 through 10, 1 through 11. Like you had like 10 or 11 legitimate teams that were in the hunt in March for an NCAA bid. I don't think there'll be quite that many teams this year, but I still think you'll probably have about seven or eight because I think Penn State will take a step back without Lamar Stevens. I think Purdue is, uh, you know, still undergoing some uh, rebuilding a little bit. Um, but uh, Maryland lost a lot when you lost Anthony Cowan and uh, Jalen Smith to the uh, NBA draft. They might take a step back. But I still think uh, you've got a lot of teams, uh, you know, and, and a lot of great coaches, too. 
uh, you know, the interesting aspect of this too is in the Big Ten, you have a lot of great venues, right? You have the Assembly Hall, Mackey Arena. How is that going to be impacted when we're still in this uh, pandemic world of probably little to no fans that will probably stretch into this winter? Uh, how that's going to affect home courts, uh, et cetera. Going to more of a nationwide outlook here, obviously there was no NCAA tournament a year ago, so Virginia is still the reigning national champion. When you look at the bigger picture in, in terms of the country as a whole, who is the team to beat this year, or maybe three or four teams that, that people should keep an eye on? Well, I think Gonzaga is a team. Uh, you know, Villanova is another team uh, that a lot of people are really high on, um, you know, nationally. Uh, you know that, uh, you know, the uh, SEC, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people are very high in Tennessee this year. You know, Kentucky is going to be there with uh, John Calipari's uh, group as well. So uh, I think there are a lot of teams. I, I still think there's a lot of parity, um, you know, Florida State and the uh, ACC as well, um, you know, with uh, North Carolina and Duke are always going to be there too. So um, a lot of really quality teams and, uh, you know, interesting Indiana will be uh, in the Maui Classic, which is actually in Asheville, North Carolina this year. Uh, they could see uh, UNC in the final game. They'll open up a province. So I still think there's a lot of parity throughout college basketball. That extended from last year and this year, I, I think you have a, a handful of teams that can really win it. And you could have teams come out of nowhere like Dayton did last year with Obi Toppin. Obviously, you don't have uh, Toppin coming back, but you could have that one, uh, you know, uh, non-Power 5 school uh, with that star player that we always see that tend to emerge during the course of the season. Shifting over to the football side for a minute, uh, we saw the defending national champion there, LSU, fall out of the top 25 this week. First time in nine years that's happened to a reigning national champ. What do you see from the, the national picture? Obviously, the Big Ten, the Pac-12 haven't started yet. The Big Ten will start here in a couple of weeks. The Pac-12 is still a week after that. But have the Big has the Big 12 maybe played itself out of the playoff picture? Do you think Oklahoma State has a case and will have an opportunity? And what do things look like now with LSU out of the way in a huge game coming up Saturday between Alabama and Georgia? Yeah, and, you know, I think Oklahoma beating Texas, too. I mean, Texas is another team that – you know, had uh, big hopes this year with El Elginger, the quarterback, um, and in the Red River shootout, Oklahoma wins a, a wild game, a shootout in two overtimes, right? Um, so, uh, but uh, Georgia, Alabama this week will definitely be the biggie. I mean, I still think, uh, you know, watching Clemson and watching uh, Trevor Lawrence, uh, gosh, awfully impressive uh, team still offensively and defensively uh, on both sides of the ball. A little shaky on special teams Clemson is, but I think every other aspect they've got it. But uh, Alabama, Georgia uh, will be interesting. Georgia appears to be the best defensive team in the SEC. And uh, how about Alabama winning that shootout with Ole Miss, uh, 63 to 48? And then Nick Shaban accusing Lane Kiffin, uh, his former uh, staff member, of stealing signs as well as defensively <laughs> as an excuse for that. Uh, only in the SEC, right? Only in the SEC. Speaking of the Big Ten, before we let you go, they released their week one schedule. We know what the schedule is going to look like finally, what, what time kickoffs are going to be, who's playing Friday, who's playing Saturday. Is there any game in that opening week that stands out to you? Yeah, I think the, uh, you know, Michigan-Minnesota, uh, that's going to be interesting. That's going to be a primetime game on ABC. And you're talking about really Minnesota, you know, P.J. Fleck building off what he did last year. He's got Tanner Morgan back, who's uh, – probably the second best quarterback in the Big Ten behind Justin Fields. Uh, you've got Rashad Bateman coming back, uh, opting back in, Chris Oppen Bell. This will be an early statement game to see where Minnesota is at. Um, but if Michigan can somehow spring the upset, then all of a sudden, you know, maybe you're saying to yourself that this could be a better Michigan team than we expected. Uh, second year offensive coordinator, Josh Gaddis at Michigan, but a new quarterback. And we'll see if, uh, you know, Joe Milton is up to the task. Thanks a lot for your time. I know it's a busy time. We have basketball and football season running together now. And, uh, hey, it's better than the alternative, right? Exactly. Great to be on as always. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Thanks again to Kevin, and we will welcome Elton back next week. You can follow Elton's Penn State coverage at EHDC12. You can follow Kevin and the Indiana Hoosiers at Kevin Brockway G1. Now it's time to head out to the Plains and check in with Clay Horning, our national sports columnist. All right, now we come to our weekly spot with Clay Horning of CNHI Sports Oklahoma. Clay, 
we saw the NBA, first of all, complete their season. Congratulations to them uh, making that work in the bubble. Zero positive tests throughout the entire time down there in Disney World. Uh, excellent job by everybody involved, players, all the way up to the league office. Uh, extraordinary effort by the NBA, and they deserve to be congratulated for that. It ended, of course, with the Los Angeles Lakers raising up the championship trophy for the 17th time, tying the Boston Celtics for the most in the NBA history. What does all of this mean for LeBron James and the ongoing argument between him and Michael Jordan about who is the greatest basketball player of all time? Well, I think that's – oh, God, that, that's so, there's so much breath to – I'm not the best guy when you give me a lot of room uh, because I try to take all of it. But um, it's I, I think what it's – I don't think it needed to, as we talked about earlier, to, for LeBron to take some sort of bad Cleveland teams to the finals. That was something. But um, it, I think it means that, hit, that at worst, perhaps, He'll always be one B, <laughs> you know, and, and there will uh, and there will always he'll he'll never win the argument uh, better than Michael uh, with with many with most probably. Uh, you know, I, I struggle very much to not make Wilt Chamberlain the best player of all time because I think his impact was greater. But does does that mean better? And and I think that people who you know gravitate to Michael the numbers don't even matter because because there was just this inevitability to watching him, knowing he would come through. Um, and with LeBron, I think what you have is a career that, it, that A, it's so long at this point, because he came right out of high school. Um, and he's just, uh, I'm, I, I've got some numbers here. <laughs> and I don't know if we want to get lost in them, but they're crazy. Um, I'll just I'll give you the, the, the ones that just sort of uh, hit me the most because I was trying to find some way to compare these two. And here's one. And, and uh, there's two different ways that uh, NBA players sort of have a war, like baseball players have wins above replacement, which is supposed to sort of be the an end all be all sort of metric of the impact of that player being on the field versus uh, a player of average uh, abilities otherwise. And in, in win shares, uh, Michael, by the way, is only fifth all time. LeBron, I believe, is third. Um, but there's another metric called uh, value over replacement player, VORP. And Michael led that category for nine consecutive seasons, uh, nine consecutive full seasons. Uh, there were two years he didn't. One year he was playing baseball. The other year he was mostly playing baseball. But in the seven, uh, in the six prior to his baseball experiment and the three post, he had uh, a VORP of 93.7 for those nine seasons, 10.4 per season. And he led the league in that category in all of those seasons. LeBron... From 0506 to 1213, led that category uh, in eight consecutive seasons. But his figure was 9.325 per season. So that's one way of looking at their primes. It's just one way. And though LeBron dishes more assists and grabs more rebounds and sort of has filled up a bigger stat sheet than Michael, he still, by that metric, what was slightly not helping his team quite as much as Michael was. So because uh, I've, I've often thought, or I think now, that those who want to look at just the, the hugeness of LeBron's career and the cavalcade of numbers and just doing it forever, I think there's a real case to be made that Michael defenders can't really refute that it's just been a bigger, uh, more uh, accomplished, as somebody who does more things on the court career than Michael's. But... Uh, but Michael will always be the guy that was never going to lose, no matter what. And LeBron managed to turn a stinker of a finals in 2011. And, you know, it is, it's just not been terrific at times. So anyway, I thought it interesting that at least you could find one number where, where Michael is even in front of uh, LeBron, not to mention title 6-0 in the finals, yada, yada. So I don't know if I settled anything there. <laughs> but... Uh, but uh, it's uh, LeBron will always be right there, but uh, he he doesn't enlighten the imagination in the same way that Michael does, and that goes beyond the numbers. So. And, 
ultimately, isn't this a really good thing for the NBA, though? I mean, the season's over, and, and there's an off season that nobody's really sure how this is going to play out. We know there's going to be a draft on November 18th, but going on, uh, and for everybody to keep talking about the league in positive terms like this? Oh, I think that's right. And I, uh, and I think... But you know what? It, yes, absolutely. But that uncertainty also sort of drives the offseason mm-hmm. because, like, this is a moment that the NBA could decide, you know what, we really want to start much closer to Christmas Day. Maybe we'll start on Christmas Day and just get it over with. And, and that's what we'll do. It's like they have that option. They can reset their league for, you know, forever. So that's very interesting as well. Um, I had one, I, I don't know. I, I thought I had another jumping off point, but not quite yet, but yeah, absolutely. That does. But the uncertainty itself is wildly interesting because I, I don't know. I mean, what does the NBA want to do? It's in this very powerful position. We can reset. We can do whatever we want to do. We can start on this day. Do, you know, do we want to make a run? I think the NFL is still King in the United States, but, uh, but do, do we want to see what we can do about that? How do we want to do it? So it's it's it is wildly interesting. Absolutely, it's a uh, basketball off season. It's always interesting, but now it's like uh, the abs- the actual you know foundations of the sport could be rewritten. Don't know where they'll play. Don't know when they'll play. Uh, in the case of Oklahoma City, don't know who will coach them when they play. Uh, certainly, a lot of questions to be answered there. But going back to the very top of this segment, the the feat that the NBA pulled off, and also the NHL and the WNBA being able to to make these bubbles work, play through their playoffs, crown champions. How big of a deal is that, really? Well, I, I might get beyond sports with this answer. I think it's a big deal. And I, and I think that what it says is when you do the things you're supposed to do, when you practice best practices, when you uh, say, well, let, how do people get this uh, disease? Uh, how can what do we do to avoid that? And you, and you put that into action. I'm not saying you could put 350 million people in a bubble, but you might get them to be a little more responsible. So anyway, it shows that it can be done or something can be done. And, and it's sort of, it, it's a proof of the value of leadership. But I hope it's a bigger lesson for everybody. Uh, so anyway, it, it's amazing that they did it as a sport. Uh, baseball sort of kicking and screaming has found its way into a couple of bubbles. So we hope there will not be any issues, but uh, the season, I think at many times, if not for seven inning double headers, uh, we would not have a baseball postseason probably. So uh, anyway, yeah, it, it's a great, it, it is a great statement. I just hope it is one that people happen to pay attention to and not just go, hey, way to go, but go, oh, maybe we can learn something from it. So. Definitely lessons that can be learned from that. Can't let you go without mentioning the Red River shootout four overtimes. Oklahoma gets the win over Texas. How, how? Where are the Sooners at now at two and two and, and coming off a big win in their in their big rivalry game? Well, I we we're not here to congratulate ourselves, but I rarely do you get a game where you hope you can measure you can write something about it that you know doesn't detract right. from it. <laughs> but uh, but that was that was a game uh, as I the first line of my column from it was. Uh, there are no words and then i wrote 900 of them but uh so at any rate the the crazy thing is we don't we don't really know but we know they won an amazing classic game that the quarterback was pulled in the middle um the offensive line sort of came to life in the third quarter it looked like all those great uh days of bob stoops whipping up on mac brown or uh or whoever the texas coach might have been where, where texas just looked like amateurs here i mean texas i swear to god for 15 years has been one win away one loss from losing four straight games and i mean even if it's the first of those four it always feels that way so um and in the third quarter oh you just took control and then oh you just died again like they did like that like it did let me get my grammar right against kansas state and uh and has done so often and then comes back to life and uh a couple of uh, not personal notes but sort of uh, personal observations drake stoops uh bob stoops son catches the winning touchdown it was one of only two catches the other catch lost yardage but he played high school ball in norman and i think 
uh, I don't want to make him uh, Wes Welker here, but uh, okay, sure. But it's like he is that kind of guy. He catches every pass, and I think he might have had a moment that is the first of many big moments. I think that's possible. Uh, TJ Pledger, who would be the fourth team uh, running back if uh, there were no suspensions and no transfers and no COVID, um, finally had a good game. Maybe he broke through. So Oh, you came a very long ways, I think, but that's not a great Texas team, and it took them four overtimes to beat them. So there's there's a great mystery surrounding the team. Which way will it go? And if it goes positive, and it the pattern has been it goes positive, but it but it ekes out victories. And it, last three seasons, same thing. They have to win. They barely win. they don't cover the spread, but boy, do they win. And uh, so it's just be interesting to see where they go. It's got to be positive. You you would like to think that it will be a. It, it, not every game will be so tight, but uh, it, they did themselves nothing but favors them. But how much is one win? I don't know. We'll see. But uh, it was it was huge. <laughs> Absolutely. Plenty of storylines still to play out here, I'm sure, over the next few weeks. We're not that far away from the Masters. It sounds really odd to say two weeks ahead of Halloween, but we've got plenty coming up. I'm sure we'll be checking in with you again soon. Thanks a lot, Clay. All right. Thanks, man. See ya. Thanks again to Clay, and thanks to all of you for watching us. You can keep up with Clay's national coverage and the Oklahoma Sooners at Clay Horning, and you can catch us every week as we take you inside the game with CNHI Sports.